All right, sure. Garrett Nussmeyer commits to LSU in a two-minute video that looked like Martin Scorsese directed this thing. It was so much better than when the local uh, news affiliate, my guy Tim Fletcher from Channel 3 News up in Shreveport, came to my house, and I looked like I just woke up because I did, and I had a beanie on because I had bedhead like Lloyd has, and that was my production of my com- uh, commitment video. So this man was two minutes of just perfection. Yeah, and if you haven't seen it, it's on his Twitter. But it, uh, I guess, when your dad is Doug Nussmeyer and he's coached like all over the country, <laughs> he like just went to every stop along the way. I thought the one thing you would appreciate, though, uh, like he got to Bama and he was like, uh, you know, it's where I learned, you know, about winning championships. And then it showed Florida, and he just didn't say anything. And then it just cut to the next school, like yes. the Cowboys. So. It's like Florida, the swamp. Next, <laughs> the best part of the video, Shay. That's right. All right, so what is LSU getting with this commitment? Uh, We kind of know where he stands as far as highly touted guy, four-star guy, coaches on, all of those type of things. But what does his skill set look like for LSU fans? Well, I mean, he's a guy that made a massive jump, and this is what you want to see. Sophomore year was his first year ever starting, uh, you know, in high school, playing for Marcus. And um, he was up and down, and he wasn't perfect, and – uh, but the growth he had from then to his second year starting was leaps and bounds. And, I mean, this year he was a nearly 4,000-yard passer. I mean, he threw 40 TDs. He had a good TD to INT ratio. Uh, maybe most importantly, I think he was at 68, 69, almost 70% completion percentage. And he's just got a real feel for the game. And I think a lot of that comes from growing up around it, as you said. I mean, he's got uh, a dad who – played in the NFL, played college, played for the Saints for a bit, uh, and has obviously been coaching on the offensive side of the ball for a long time. And to have someone like that around you and to grow up around football programs when you're a quarterback, I think you soak in a bit of everything, how programs work, how offenses work, how defenses work. And uh, I think in year two as a junior, uh, that really translated. He looked confident. He's a kid who he's not going to run. I mean, he's, he's a pro-style quarterback. He's not going to run all over the field. He's athletic enough, but I think the athleticism shows with off-platform throws when the pocket breaks down or when he scrambles. He's still accurate, and, and he knows where the ball's supposed to go. And uh, I just get a feeling that he's going to continue to trend up into his senior season. And, and you'll remember, um, they or if you didn't remember, I'm about to inform you, uh, before he ever started a game uh, at Marcus. So this was right after his freshman year. Uh, Inzmir talked to Doug Nussmeyer and said, hey, look, bring him over, bring him to camp, let's work him out. Um, his recruitment hasn't started. He has no offers. Uh, let's see how he throws. I'll give you you know, some feedback. And he threw for a few days, and the feedback was, I'll give you his first offer right now. And uh, Inzmir and Orgeron handed it to him, and, and this was before the Joe Brady era. And so they've been building this really for two years, and – uh, I think two things that also stand out beyond the reality that Orgeron and Hinsmeyer played a big role here was um, you lose Joe Brady and everybody says, okay, well, what's going to happen? I mean, uh, are the quarterbacks still going to be interested, et cetera? Um, they didn't make these hires for Garrett Nussmeyer, obviously, but when you've got a dad like Doug Nussmeyer, uh, you run into these types of connections. And Scott Linehan replaces Joe Brady, and Scott Linehan obviously – Uh, was on staff with the Cowboys uh, at the same time as Doug Nussmeyer, who's still on that staff. Uh, And then you look at a guy who, uh, with George Munoz gone to Baylor, the lead analyst on offense is a a kid, really, but a guy named Russ Calloway, uh, who had been the OC at Samford uh, over in Alabama and had broken a bunch of school records and was kind of a hot name, and and that's how they found him. But uh, he cut his teeth before that. Uh, working at Alabama as an analyst right in the beginning of when Saban started building up these support staffs. He was Nuss- Doug Nussmeyer's right-hand man when Doug Nussmeyer was the OC at Alabama. I guess that was, what, 2011, 2012, right in that range. So uh, you hire two guys that not only does Garrett Nussmeyer know about and has met in the past, but that his father, Doug, uh, is good friends with. And one of them, he was a mentor to in Callaway. And then uh, obviously a peer with Scott Linehan. So I think that for them, everything just fit between LSU's offense changing, them playing well, uh, it not being that far from Dallas, it being a high-level SEC program, and then it being around people like them and Orgeron and Insmeer that uh, I think their family and, and probably most importantly Garrett really trust.
Shay, you answered my question in the middle of your of your answer there, but I, I just kind of want to go back to it because I, I thought about it when I saw the, the commitment and, and some of the connections because we know that somehow, some way, Ben Simmons' godfather ended up on a staff here and Ben Simmons followed. It's not You're not under the impression that any hire was made for the passing game coordinator because of a high school quarterback, huh? No, I think they could have gotten Garrett Nussmeyer regardless of who they, you know, if it was Scott Linehan or someone else. I just think that they had done a, a good enough job recruiting him all along. Now I think that it helped, right? I think it eased their mind in a in a period like this, for instance, where Caleb Williams, another quarterback out there, says, uh, I'm not deciding anything yet, and if I'm going to entertain LSU at all, well, I'm going to need to come over and meet Scott Linehan, and I'm going to need to meet Russ Calloway, and I want to talk more with Inzmir and Orgeron in person, uh, and you can't do that right now. But for the Nussmeyer camp, they don't need any of that. They're, they know the, those two guys very well, let alone two years of, of you know, being recruited by Orgeron and Inzmir. So, no, I don't think it had anything to do with Garrett because I think they could have gotten him either way, but I think it helped. Shay, obviously we know that the spring evaluation period and summer camps bring with them a slew of, a slew of scholarship offers and commitments. And now with the early signing period, you can pretty much put – 95% of your class to bed, you know, before Christmas. Do we think that because of this national pandemic, this is going to shove that calendar back and that maybe this time some of the bulk of a lot of classes is going to be made up in the second signing period? You know, it could go, I think we'll see both. Huh? And it's, it's a great question that I think we'll find out an answer to because we've never experienced this. Ohio state, Tennessee, they're sitting on like 18 to 20 commits. So, they're almost going to be done by the time the season starts. And uh, that's, in my mind, now Ohio State's recruiting at an extremely high level and Tennessee for the, where they're at as a program is too. Uh, but that's a risky proposition because it's one thing to watch film and game film and all that. But until you have them, A, you mentioned the spring evaluation period, that's when these coaches get to go to a high school and watch the kids work out and watch them in person. And, and maybe most importantly, you know, look, on film, I'm turning on this Evangel film. Golly, Jacob Hester looked 6'4", 245, like a, you know, machine out here. And then I get you in camp, and, and you're not that at all. Right? Trying to say I'm not 6'4"? You know, yeah, this is just a, an example. Somehow you still <laughs> snuck into the class. But uh, so often, guys, between spring evals where you get an eye on them and say, okay, here's where they're at right now that I can't see in pads. And then summer, when is the only time you're legally allowed, you know, under NCAA rules, to work these kids out, to put them through drills, to do things you would do with your current team, and your evaluation speeds up so much. Like, boom. Like, I don't think he can cut it. I know what my corners look like, and I think he would be too far behind, and they move on. Or, hey, look, this kid has got some serious upside, uh, and a lot of times those kids are the ones who get the offers in the summer camp. So, we're shifting towards, as Orgeron said, everyone's on the same page, but more so than ever in the past, however long you want to count, they got to rely on film and production at the high school level and all these uh, different things that, you know, you're used to doing and used to using for an eval, but it's never the end all be all. I think right now it's turned into, all right, how good are we at evaling off film after trusting um, you know, high school coaches we know to tell us the truth about where guys at. Uh, and, you know, we had some of these kids in camp last summer. We got to see them last fall. Uh, did we do a good enough job to make those decisions right now about it? And uh, I think LSU's shown uh, that they're doing well with recruiting in this sort of down period. They're not taking uh, a bunch of nobodies. They're taking really high-profile guys who can make an impact. But uh, you want to be sure you can continue that in a year where I already thought Orgeron was saying, all right, how do I come off a national championship season, 15-0, NFL draft, I dominated it. I don't want to put myself into a position like I did last year where I'm crunching numbers, you know, we're parting ways with guys late uh, with the hope that maybe we fill them with some of these extra spots or, or open spots. And uh, I think that makes it even more difficult to say, how do we avoid that without having a summer camp, without having spring evals? And it, it may be impossible, but I like that they started a bit slower, and now we're seeing them kind of pick up speed uh, after they've got a good feel for what their board looks like. 
Shay, when you look at quarterbacks in this class, obviously Caleb Williams released his top three. Oklahoma, Maryland, LSU was in there as well. Does Nussmeyer committing do anything to the recruitment of Caleb Williams? Yeah, I mean, I think that Caleb Williams is going to go to Oklahoma, has always been my guess. Like, let's put ourselves – this is why I really like the addition right now. Let's put ourselves in Orgeron's shoes. The last school that Caleb Williams visited before the shutdown was Oklahoma. And a lot of kind of rumors started swirling that he had silently committed. And you see the 24-7 sports crystal balls roll in from people. And it's like, okay, uh, it's pretty evident that they're out front. And if you want to win, you know, beat them out or pull ahead of them, you're going to need to wait until the end of all this when they can visit again. Uh, and then you say, well, even then, are we going to get them? Because the other school in his top three is Maryland. And we saw Loxley, how they operate is – quietly. I mean, we saw them flip Raheem Jarrett on signing day from LSU uh, without m many people really knowing or being too hip to it. Uh, and many people think, hey, look, that could happen with Caleb Williams. I mean, he, Washington, D.C., Loxley's all over him. Suddenly, they're in his top three after he's got the who's who out there of teams. So, I think if you're Orgeron, you say, all right, I can wait around and this kid can go to OU. I can wait around and he can go to Maryland. Uh, I could take him and he could commit and then flip to one of those schools like Maryland on me. Uh, or right now, I can take Garrett Nussmeyer, someone I have strong conviction in in terms of what I think is upside and how good he is um, and don't see some major fall off from Caleb Williams despite what one might be ranked versus the other. Uh, and that way you're not left at the altar. And this isn't just Orgeron. This is everybody out there. Coaches learn all the time. You know, I'm rolling the dice here, and I know that I can get to the end and come up snake eyes, and I have nobody. And at quarterback, that's a terrible strategy, in my opinion. So take Nussmeyer now, who, and I don't want this to be painted at all as like, well, then at least you have somebody. Like, he's legit. He's right. the number seven pro style quarterback in the country. If you like him that much, don't worry about what Caleb Williams has going on. Take Nussmeyer, and if you know, Williams wants to look around and says, well, I still want to go to LSU too. I'll be in a two quarterback class. Great. Come on, join the club. If not, then we've already got a guy committed in Nussmeyer. And I think Orgeron feels good about that. Catching up with Shay Dixon here on hang with Hester. Shay, we'll get you out of here with this one. Talk about real quick, the top guys in Louisiana, where LSU stands with them. Yeah. I mean, look, it's kind of a short list right now. And, and this is where it kind of stinks is because a lot of these Louisiana kids really get evaled in spring and, and then summer camp where I can put, you know, this kid from Catholic up against my five guys I like from outside the state. And if he's just as good as them, if not better, I'm offering him and I'm taking him. I'll take the Louisiana kid. That doesn't happen this cycle, but there's some no brainers. D line Mason Smith is the number one player in the state down in, uh, the Thibodeau area, I still think he winds up at LSU. Savion Jones is the other at St. James. He was unbelievable for them on that run uh, with Shaz pressed into a state title. So I feel good about those two winding up at LSU. And then you quickly shift a receiver because Brian Thomas at Walker is an absolute freak. You've got Chris Hilton at Zachary, who's a stud. You've got Malik Neighbors and a bunch of other kids in Louisiana uh, who – are elite top 250 receivers, but don't have offers yet uh, just because, you know, once you offer a Louisiana kid, you got to jump on them. Um, but I look at that group and I look at Sage Ryan out of LCA, who he does everything, literally plays every position for them. I think he'll end up being a DB probably at the next level, um, perhaps a safety, but he's someone that I think when your bloodlines like inner family include Trev Falk and Kevin Falk and Kevin Falk's on staff, that it's pretty hard to lose him, no matter if he has a top 50 prospect and has Bama and everybody else. So that's kind of my early group of five or six guys that I would still say, hey, look, they're pressing them. And none of them at this stage, Jacob uh, and Hunt, I would say are leans to other schools. So even if it's a small Louisiana class uh, compared to many years of the past, uh, I think it'll be quality. They'll end up with all the top guys. Shay, you're the man. You can follow along with Shay at Shay Dixon on Twitter. Appreciate your time, brother. All right, guys. Thanks.